minute. I'm just going to put up now a photo of our guest this afternoon, uh, Mr. Ben Fellows. Um, this is an article from The Express um, where the, they ran a story where Ben was recounting his experiences as being a child actor. Uh, and in the article, Ben is talking about running a gauntlet of paedophiles at the BBC. And he's claiming that the entertainment industry was rife with sex abuse. Um, so we should have Ben on the line now. Are you there, Ben? Yes, I am, Brian. Hello. Good, good yep. afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and I can hear you clearly. What's the weather like in London, then? Uh, it's pretty miserable, actually. It's very foggy, and um, it's quite mild, but it's, uh, it's, it's that warm air hitting the cold air, so we've got lots of fog at the moment. Okay. I, I had to ask that, because it's a little bit of light-heartedness on the programme, yep. what's the weather doing? And I was very pleased to see you looked out the window, which is, of course, what we do down here. Um, now, serious um, uh, stuff, Ben. Obviously, uh, many people in the country at the moment are, are really shocked. I hear it in my local uh, community where they are saying, what on earth is going on? Um, I think many people have believed that sort of paedophiles and child abuse was something that always happened somewhere else to other people. Uh, they believed, have believed that it's been something that happens at the bottom of the social chain. And now all of a sudden they are hearing in a matter of a few days that not only has it been happening at the heart of the BBC, but of course we've also now got indications uh, that it's happening at the heart of Westminster. So I, I'll give you um, an open introduction. What can you tell us about your experiences then um, within the uh, within the media industry and as a as a child actor. Well, uh, I, I think you know um, uh, I was lucky in a way because I was a jobbing child actor. I started at the age of ten at the Royal Shakespeare uh, Theatre in Stratford, and I dotted around and uh, did various TV uh, series and theatre series. I wasn't in one show for say six or seven years, so I had a good overview. Um, of what the industry is like and every single job I ever went for um, pretty much almost all auditions which is another thing that I, uh, I'm quite passionate about because auditions need to be chaperoned uh, as well not just um, say the, the job you do uh, uh, they all had a sexual context to it when I was a child so for example um, if I'd go for a commercial um, quite often or not you were asked to take yourself off now I'm a boy uh, I was 10, 12 years old, uh, that's not a problem, so you take your top off, and they say, can you actually just take your bottoms off as well and pretend you're on the beach? So you do that, because you're a kid and you're playing. Uh, you're there very innocently trying to get a commercial, um, which would actually pay quite a bit of money and stuff like that, so you're willing to do whatever they say. Um, if you don't do it, they'll just go, thanks a lot, and get someone else to do it. So you do these things. Um, so it leaves you in a very vulnerable position. Um, and of course, you don't know where these photos or videotape is going to go. And on one occasion, my mother was contacted by the police. Um, I, uh, it was a big commercial that I'd been for the previous week and said that the photos that they had taken had been used um, in a paedophile catalogue and had been passed around from the production company to outside paedophiles. And that's how they heard about it. Would we be prepared to go to court and be witnesses? So, of course, we said yes. I mean, we didn't hear anything else about it, because I think they had two or three hundred boys, uh, and I was just one of those. So um, uh, it's everywhere. And, of course, people are shocked, because this is one of the most trusted institutions in the country. Um, and it's at the heart of the BBC. Now, to me, that's not news. So what I wanted to do was just basically say to people, look, um, this isn't just the BBC, this is the wider industry. I'm no longer an actor, really, um, uh, so I'm not interested in having a career in the business. So I'll tell you quite frankly what I, my experience was like. Of course, people who are still actors in the business, people who are still wanting to have to be on television or work for these uh, organisations, they're not going to come out and say anything because we all know that you don't bite the hand that feeds. So um, I'm quite happy to come out and say, well, look, you know, I've got a different career now. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a journalist, um, I have no interest in these people whatsoever, so I can come out, and I, I've made several complaints now uh, about BBC staff, um, I, I slept with BBC staff, I'm not, uh, um, but women, I, I'm not gay, I think if I was gay, I'd have had an even tougher time, um, as friends of mine did, um, however, um, I was on the outside of this sort of circle, I suppose you'd like to call it, and so over the years, you get to know everybody, and 
you, they offer you drugs, they offer you alcohol. This is all between the ages of sort of 10 and 17. And, uh, and you do it and you take it because you want to be involved with these people. These are very powerful people. Most are very famous people. And um, uh, you think that by doing this, you are going to have some sort of advantage uh, because they might introduce you to somebody. Uh, for example, BBC producer um, who uh, I had a one night stand with effectively uh, basically promised me that um, she'd introduced me to uh, Blue Peter to be a Blue Peter presenter. Well, back in the 90s, Blue Peter was like one of the top shows uh, on television. And if you were a Blue Peter presenter, you had sort of arrived really. Uh, your career was kind of set. So um, uh, that was a very big draw for me. Of course, after you, um, after I'd slept with her and stuff, I'd, you know, I'd never heard from her again pretty much. Um, and that was it. So, you know, you're used and then abused and, and, and you go along because, you know, I, I, I thought I was streetwise and stuff, but you're a kid. You don't know what you're doing. Adults know exactly what they're doing, um, especially when they're 40 or, or plus or whatever. I mean, um, uh, so, you know, you're kind of uh, led down this very sort of murky, dark tunnel. But on the outside, it's wonderful because it's the entertainment industry. So no one's going to believe you. No one's going to believe that this very famous personality has just basically giving you a line of coke in their dressing room um, <clears throat> and has asked you to have sex with them. Uh, no one believes that. So you didn't complain. There wasn't a culture of saying, uh, I'll make uh, keep a list in a diary and then I'll complain about it later. You didn't do that. It wasn't that kind of culture, uh, especially at the BBC. And the, the phrase was really sort of um, uh, what goes on in the BBC stays in the BBC. And this is what comes of sort of... Uh, a corporate incest that the BBC suffers from and other organisations in the entertainment industry, whereby they only uh, hire people from a very small pool of universities. Well, of course, when you do that, you can get a paedophile in, uh, and we all know that when you get one paedophile in or child abuser, they will then let in others. And in the BBC specifically, it wasn't, you didn't get hired because of what you knew, you got hired because of who you knew. And that's a very famous phrase in the BBC, and it's not what you know, it's who you know uh, that counts. And that's because what they were doing is building a protection mechanism uh, whereby anything, whether it was uh, drugs, it was prostitution, um, and there was a lot of that going on, uh, whether it was underage uh, drinking um, you know, and, and stuff like that, and child abuse, uh, paedophilia. Um, uh, this now is a culture where nobody complains. And in fact, if you did complain, you wouldn't be hired again. You'd lose your job and people would come out against you. I mean, even this week, when other journalists from uh, when we've got the mainstream interested have been contacting the BBC, asking them about my story, and some people are saying I wasn't even on that show, even though there I am recorded on the show. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. So the kind of thing is, is that because this is such an emotive um, uh, topic that people will just distance themselves, even if you know I've had private conversations with people. Uh, who has said, yeah, I'm on your side, I'm with you, I just can't do it publicly because I don't know how this is going to turn out for me, and they're still in the industry. And that's how this is kept a secret. I mean, you know, so I'm not surprised that people are, are shocked. Right. Um, ben, one of the things that we're, we're going to talk some pretty serious subjects this afternoon, um, people who haven't heard of you before, uh, I imagine what's going to be going in their minds is, well, who who is this man? And... Um, how do we know he's reliable? How do we trust what he says? Um, is he is he reliable uh, witness? I'm, I'm being you know upfront with this because we we are talking some subjects which are very serious. So what what I like you to do is um, could you just you know um, take your time, but just give us a little bit about your history. You've become a child actor. How does that actually happen, and who do you come into contact with? Um, as you start to move through, you're selected, presumably at some stage, and then, then you start to go through training. Could you just give us a little bit of that background, and then we can move on through some of the, the other things you've experienced? Well, for me, it started when uh, I was just coming up to my 10th birthday, and we saw an advertisement in the family in the um, local paper. I lived in Solihull in Birmingham, so it was the Solihull Times, and uh, it was for a Saturday morning drama class. And you know, it, it got me out of my sister's hair. My mother could go and do shopping, and I go to drama class where you do improvisation, you do face painting, and and you basically just have fun as a kid. And I loved it. I lapped it up. Six months after joining uh, the RSC, uh, came they were looking all over the country for a mixed race boy 
uh, the play opposite uh, Hugh Quashi in Adrian Noble's production of Macbeth, uh, which was his first sort of big um, job as artistic director. Uh, and so I was asked if I'd like to go and audition because my drama school had been approached by the RSC. And I said, it would be great. And they just said to me, look, go. It'll be great experience. You'll see what a real audition is like. Because I've never been to any audition before. I, I, it wasn't as if I wanted to be an actor. This was just a, a Saturday morning thing to have fun with, um, as you do as a child. So uh, I went along. I said my audition speech as we, my drama teacher and I rehearsed uh, a couple of days before. And we got a call in the evening and said that they would like me to do it. Um, there wasn't that many uh, back then, in, what, 1986, I'll say. So um, uh, I think they'd seen about 800 uh, boys, and, you know, so uh, so I got the part. And uh, and so that started the process of me being a child actor. I went to rehearsals, We'd you know, you'd meet all the other actors. But one thing about the RSC, and um, I'd like to make this really clear, um, is that they have excellent child management. In other words, when your parents took you to the stage door, the chaperone met you then and there, and they never left your side while you were at the RSC. Um, it was made aware to us, um, and I remember quite specifically being told by my chaperone never to be um, in any other active dressing room, male or female, um, and have them close the door without a chaperone being uh, present and stuff like that. They took you from your dressing room to the stage. So much so that it got annoying. You know, I was a kid, I could go up and down the stage and back to my dressing room uh, on my own, uh, you know, it got quite annoying, but the point was is that they were doing their job and um, uh, they were excellent for it, and in fact I've just received a letter from the RSC, uh, again very thankful telling me how the, their procedures are basically really very good still, that, you know, uh, but however if I've got any um, issues and stuff like that I can bring them up, a sensible conversation about this because the RSC know that you don't know who you're letting in as other actors into your organisation. These could be very famous people. They're all very nice people, um, nothing untoward, but you don't know who they are. And that's what people have kind of got to realise about the BBC, is that you've watched people on telly, but that's not who they are. That's a persona, uh, a personality that they put forward. Um, but we don't know what they get up to in their private life, and perhaps we shouldn't. But the point is, we need one foot, one step outside of the box as well when we, we listen to these people and we watch these people. Just say, well, look, they are real people. We don't know who they are. They could get up to anything. Uh, and we kind of missed that. So once I was at the RSC, um, it went very quickly from there because obviously I was featured in all just, the new... Can I just briefly come in, come in there? So uh, for viewers and listeners, the RSC, the Royal Shakespeare Company, I think is what you're describing here. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, Royal Shakespeare uh, Company. And um, and so from there, you, you, you get to know very quickly how the industry works. I was given some very sound advice by actor Hugh Kwashi, who's in uh, Casualty, uh, or Holby now. And he said to me, um, uh, this business is soul-destroying, don't come into it. He said, if you want to come into it, go back to school, get your exam, go to university, and then in your 20s, when you're an adult, you can come into the business. Well, I didn't listen, did I? I was a kid and I was very eager, uh, but he was absolutely right. He was spot on. Uh, the uh, entertainment industry is no place for children. So after the RSC, I was featured in lots of newspapers and stuff like that. Uh, I was being offered jobs. Um, I did uh, 12 nights in uh, Birmingham for the Birmingham Rep. I did big tours of 15 streets. Um, uh, with Catherine Crookson's 15 Streets for the Alexandra Theatre and, and big tours up and down the country, nine month tours. And I was, you know, a kid. So from the age of sort of 13, by the time I'd sort of really properly got an agent, uh, that's the other thing that you need. You need an agent to be able to get auditions. Um, and I signed with an agent called Royal Management in uh, London. So I was coming down to London uh, by that time, pretty much on my own, on the train at age 13. My mum would drop me off on the train. I would be picked up at the other end of the train, and um, you know, and I'd go to these auditions. So you need an agent, and then it's just a matter of going to auditions, doing your best, and hopefully trying to get jobs. And I did. You know, I worked in many musicals. I worked on lots of television programs. I was a little bit on EastEnders. I did uh, Second Thoughts with James Bolam and Julia Sawada, many other things. And um, um, my biggest employer was the BBC, I have to say. Uh, so uh, I did many uh, TV shows for the BBC, but because I wasn't a regular on any particular show, I would do an episode here and an episode there. And someone said to me the other day, well, I've looked on IMBD and I can't see really what you've done. I said, well, IMBD didn't exist when I was doing it in the early 90s. Um, uh, 
So, um, you know, and I don't have an agent now, so you need an agent to put things up on IMBD, you know. So, you know, in my day, I travelled around, I went all around the country with different shows and theatre uh, projects. Uh, I worked with very famous people. I worked with very famous directors. And when I mean very famous, I'm talking sort of world-class um, musical theatre uh, uh, directors and producers. Uh, you know, these weren't sort of um, uh, sort of low-budget shows or profit share shows, as some people call them. These were major musicals and major productions, and the same with television. So, you know, I've got extensive experience as a child actor, but it was over a wide range uh, of, of situations. For example, I did a lot of modelling when I was a child. And, as, you know, I was in Kay's catalogue and various other catalogues and stuff like that because I was a cute, raised kid with a nice smile. And that, uh, unfortunately attracts the wrong kind of attention in this business. Right. Um, I'm going to keep you carrying on through your career, but I just want to just ask you one thing. We're seeing quite a bit in the mainstream papers and the media at the moment, uh, when people are talking particularly about the Savile affair, they're very often saying, well, of course, back then, that's the way it was. We had, uh, we had groupy girls. There was a much more liberal attitude. It was the swinging 60s, it was the swinging 70s. And uh, to my mind, there's a sort of hint that uh, the media is trying to drift people's opinions and views into thinking, well, of course, there was bad stuff that went on back then, but it's not happening now. Now, you're talking the period, um, I think you mentioned 1986 there, uh, you're talking early 90s. So in your experience in the 80s and 90s, and we won't go into too much detail at this stage, but just generally in your experience in the 80s and 90s, um, how do you feel? Is it going on or was it going on then as opposed to just back in the 60s and 70s? Absolutely. The period of 1986, well, the period of where I was from 10 years old uh, to being, let's say, 17, uh, just before the age of consent, um, I uh, had had uh, sex with uh, uh, five or six women um, who were all in their 40s, or who were all either producers, directors, casting directors, um, uh, influential people within the industry. Uh, this cuts across everything. Um, and also, I was given drugs and alcohol. This is all underage. I was going into Stringfellows at age 14. Uh, I had an open invitation to go to Stringfellows. Uh, I wasn't the only child in there. That's the point, you know? Right. Okay, right, thanks for that. Now, your career um, um, at some stage started to take an interesting direction because you appear to have moved away from, um, uh, I will say, ordinary acting into um, undercover work. Was that part of your acting career or was that something that happened separately? No, it was part of it. It sort of crossed over, really. Um, when I was uh, 17, when I was 18, a family friend basically said, look, um, uh, who worked for Central Television in Birmingham, said that uh, the Cook Report were looking for someone to help them out. And, uh, and, you know, would Ben be interested? Well, you know, this family friend worked at a television company. This was a good opportunity for me. I'd already worked for Central as an actor. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I'd already worked for Central Television as an actor, and so this was a great opportunity. And I thought, yeah. So he introduced me to the producers of the Cook Report, who were working on a particular program, which was about cash for questions, uh, political lobbyists being influencing MPs to ask questions in the, in the Houses of Parliament, etc. And uh, I walked through the door. Uh, the producer looked at me, and she said, "You're perfect." And then it was just a matter of having a general conversation. But then I was in because of the way I looked, and the way I looked was um, I was 17 going on to be 18, but I looked like I was 14, uh, 15. That was the whole point of it, is that this businessman that they were setting up to have this sting operation, and this businessman needed a young assistant because there was a lot of talk at the time about politicians um, having these young assistants. And when I'm talking about young assistants, I'm talking about 16, 15, you know, 17, you know, really young guys. Um, and so they thought it would might grease the wheels and uh, move them further into the sting if I was part of it. And the reason that they wanted a mixed race child was because Ian Greer, who was the political lobbyist involved in Cash for Questions, had a mixed race boyfriend in his 40s, I think, or 30s at that time. Um, and so if the businessman that Central were putting in had a mixed race uh, boy, then it would, uh, it would help. And the, what I was told was to say, if you're ever asked by anybody how old you are, you are to tell them that you're 15 years old. So when I met Ian Greer, 
and he, you know, hugged me and rubbed himself up and down me when I met Ken Clark and, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and he touched me and all that kind of stuff. They, we'd already had the conversation that I was 15. Ken Clark knew how old I was. Ian Greer knew how old I was. So it wasn't like they were groping or touching someone who they thought was 18. They knew I was 15 or that's what they believed. And, and that's the important thing, I think, in this. So that's how I kind of got involved because I wasn't afraid of cameras or wearing covert cameras. The incident with Ken Clark was filmed. It is on videotape and the Cook Report has that uh, now. So hopefully that will come out in the next few days uh, when people actually start doing some digging. Um, right, okay, I'm going to come, come back to, to that incident just because, I know, excuse me, Cook Report, just so that we can be very uh, clear, maybe younger viewers might not be fully aware. What um, sort of material did the Cook Report cover altogether? Can you just give us a sort of synopsis of... Um, of the Cook re Report and how it went about its business? Um, the, the, the Cook Report is an investigative journalist program. It's actually probably the best investigative journalist program this country has ever produced. Um, Roger Cook was a senior investigative journalist, uh, made his name in Australia. Um, he'd come over to this country. He was um, you know, a, a, a crime correspondent, I think, for a time. He was, he was a big player in, in, in journalism. Um, and he had a series called The Cook Report. That's what, he, uh, as part of his career path and what have you. And they did wonderful stories. They did, you know, um, uh, stories that sort of people wouldn't be interested, wouldn't wouldn't touch. So they they, they did uh, stories on gun running and making new buying new material. Uh, when <clears throat> excuse me, when getting that sort of stuff, you know, the Cold War was still on at that point, so getting nuclear material was like a really big deal, you know, proving that, sort of that terrorism existed and stuff like that, and that these people, you could go out and buy actually nuclear material. So it was, it was very challenging stories. They weren't afraid of anything, the Cook Report, and it was a local regional programme coming out of Central Television in Birmingham that got networked because it was so good. Um, uh, and so uh, Roger Cook became very famous, and of course he did this doorstepping um, Famously, he'd turn up at your doorstep with a camera and obviously run the risk of being hit or pushed out of the way and shoved. But he would pursue people. And that just doesn't happen anymore, which I think is why all this is kind of taken place a lot, because we've allowed journalists and journalism to be perverted in some way where, you know, it can be hidden and behind closed doors. It never comes out. Uh, Roger Cook would have beaten this uh, down years ago um, had he had give, been given the opportunity to. So it's a very good program. And it was very exciting to be a part of that, even a very small part of that, which I was. You know, I wasn't privy to the um, the overall idea of the program. I just knew the bit that I was involved in, uh, which is what, it, 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 which is how the Cook Report worked. It was very compartmentalised. One group of people working on a Cook Report story didn't know what the another group was working on. It was very secretive. It was actually almost like being, um, you know, a secret agent or something like that. You know. You know, you couldn't even get into the building without various codes and passes um, that were additional to the ones you need to get into the building with anyway. So the Cook Report was a, an extremely good um, investigative journalism program that really should be still on to this day, but unfortunately, um, because <laughs> it got cancelled, um, it, it wasn't on. So it wasn't afraid of shining, you know, shining a light onto these people. And the questions just was one of those uh, topics that they covered. Right. Um so that we're clear on this, you, you mentioned it, it was operating from central television. What, what does that actually mean? Was, was this part of BBC or was this independent but feeding to other people? Oh, no. This is, central television is a, an independent or was an independent broadcaster on the ITV network, which is where uh, the Cook Report uh, was on. And what would happen is that uh, years ago, uh, television was broken apart and you would have Meridian in, in one part of the country, uh, South Television in Southampton broadcasting, um, uh, Central Television in the Midlands, and they broadcast to their regions. However, if they come up with a really great program, it would then be networked. So, for example, Supermarket Suite came out of Meridian, I think in Southampton, and it was networked. So it started off as a regional program and then went moved into a national program. Um, for a later series. Well, the Cook Report did the same thing. It started off being regional and then it moved into being networked. And of course, networked meant the entire country. Um, and so that's how it uh, got its programs out. Right. OK. Now, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to cut across to another um, subject and then bring people back. Because at the moment, what I'm what I'm doing is we're and you're doing a great job, Ben. So keep keep going. We're setting the scene. We're having a look at who you are and what your experience is. 
Um, and, and you're no ordinary actor, you've just been taking us through the fact that you have real experience in investigative um, media. And uh, as you've said, the Cook Report went into some very dark and, and at times dangerous subjects. So, uh, in my opinion anyway, you've got some pretty unique experience there. But you put those skills to good use um, recently with, um, with the G4S, the security firm that was handling the Olympics. And uh, many people now the Olympics are over will have forgotten, I think, the fact that uh, G4S, which was paid millions of pounds of money to provide security, has, um, uh, uh, was then failing. And you came up and revealed some of the some of the disastrous things that were going on with G4S. How, how did you actually um, get set up to do that G4S thing? Was, was that you using your cook skills? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, the Olympics was coming to town. It's the biggest event in the world. And I just went, well, look, you know, let's sign up for security and, uh, and let's see how well they do it. I was already interested in G4S anyway. I'd heard a number of scare stories about them. I wanted to do an investigation into them. I didn't really want to go and join G4S, the organization, and spend years working there just to, to see how good or bad they were. So the Olympics gave me a unique opportunity to join in a very short amount of time. I joined, do the Olympics training, see what the Olympics was like, and try and get an overview of the company. However, uh, when I went there, you know, uh, I expected to be one of many undercover journalists uh, to, to, to be involved. Um, and I, it turns out that I was the only one. And um, uh, I, I really saw the shambles of what they were trying to do and it was ridiculous it was insane so i had to come out and say look you know um i know this great event's about to happen it's a wonderful sporting event but the um the x-ray machines operators aren't trained properly the metal detectors don't work so uh, you know instead of having all these missiles on buildings and snipers and aircraft and aircraft carriers and all that kind of stuff uh, a terrorist all they would really need to do is queue up and basically, that's what I said. And then it went on from there. And obviously, it, it, it took off on the alternative media um, first and then moved into the, to the mainstream. However, on the mainstream, I wasn't credited at all, or, or neither was the alternative media accredited at all in uh, whistleblowing the story. Uh, and in fact, we watched a Sky News report where someone was almost pretending to be me, <laughs> you know, rather than them interview me. So um, uh, on that occasion, I was kept sort of very much behind the scenes of mainstream media. Everyone in the alternative media, I think, knew about the story. They were interested, and it spread uh, virally across the internet, which is the power of the alternative media. Uh, but the mainstream didn't really do anything. Uh, on this occasion, uh, it's very different. The um, once we got, I, we broke the story on the twenty first century wire, um, Patrick Henningsen's blog. Uh, uh, it's taken you know about a week or two, but the mainstream media are now calling me up and interviewing me about uh, my experience here because it casts light over the, the wider audio, uh, the, the wider picture of what's going on in the industry. Yeah. Now, of, of course, the the your work with the G four S thing, we saw absolutely that what you came along and talked about was happening. That, as you say, did appear in the mainstream media. Um, so. Credit where it's due, Ben. Your your work was spot on, and eventually the 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 information and the truth that you were bringing out was so powerful that the mainstream media did have to react to it. I can't remember the MP's name, but I know that at the time there was um, one particular MP who said uh, on record when there was a debate about whether there was a problem with G4S said words to the effect, of course there's a debate because the alternative media have been talking about G4S and the failings for weeks. And that for me was, was um, a very powerful indication of, um, uh, you know, of uh, not only what you were saying, but the fact that alternative media is now starting to get out information which either the mainstream media can't or, or won't get out. Um, just to clarify, did, did any of the mainstream media or press outlets interview you at all with G4S or not? Um, oh, did they? I can't remember, actually. Maybe they did, but they didn't run the story. Um, yeah, they, I mean, no one ran my story, my story anyway, about, about it. Um, right. I was everyone and anyone I could get hold of um, uh, to do things. But, um, I, yeah, I can't remember, actually, now. Um, maybe I did speak to mainstream journalists, but they didn't run it anyway, so uh, it doesn't matter. Well, they, they, ra they ran it, but not with you included, because it certainly hit, hit the, the headlines, didn't it? Um, so, um, 
if we bring us back to the subject at the moment, you've, you've actually also spoken to the Times recently about what you know has been going on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? This is one of the key p parts of the story that was on Patrick Henningsen's 21st Century Wire um, site, uh, which has caused a huge impact. Um, how did the Times get involved with, with what you've been seeing and talking about? Well, when I, I wrote the article originally, uh, we put it up on the, um, the website. Um, it then got picked up by Guido Fawkes and went viral. Um, uh, and along with many other uh, sites as well. So the, the Times got in touch. Um, you know, what we've got to kind of understand is that the Times, they were wanting to beat up on the BBC uh, for, you know, basically what the BBC did was they cancelled a Newsnight production because of their Christmas schedule. That's a very important thing to, to, to understand, is their Christmas schedule. So... Time guy uh, Jack Mulvern, the um, uh, very is a senior uh, veteran uh, correspondent at the Times, uh, when he called up and said, "Look, I'd like to do an interview," and they said, "Look, we will do a very uh, big showing. You know, we'll have pictures and stuff. It will be a great article." Uh, I, I jumped at the chance, and I know I was going to appear um, on the UK column last week. But what they said to me was like, "Look." Um, can we have it as an exclusive? Uh, no money was ever mentioned. It was just a simple exclusive, a, a gentleman's agreement, if you will. I wouldn't do any other interviews until the time had run it on the Saturday. So I sat with Jack Morven on all day Thursday afternoon and uh, uh, told him my story. And he was very interested and what have you. And said, well, look, don't worry. We're either going to run the story with names or without names. Um, so, but we're definitely going to run the story. And they had the exclusive until Saturday uh, last week. Well, Saturday came and um, it, the story didn't run. And so I started inquiring um, with contacts I have um, in the Murdoch Empire. Uh, and uh, they basically said, look, it's, it, it, they're not going to do it because somebody you named um, is uh, running Sky Television's pretty much, well, not running it, but is, is the main feature of their Christmas schedule, which is exactly the same thing as happened at the BBC. So they were criticizing the BBC for pulling a program. But when it came to their opportunity to run the story, uh, a, a story about child abuse and paedophilia in the entertainment industry, they also pulled their story because of a, uh, of a Sky television Christmas uh, schedule. Now, why is this Christmas schedule so important in television? Well, the Christmas schedule is the most watched um, schedule in the whole year. Um, it's winter, it gets dark early, people stay in and they watch a lot of television. So it's very important for ratings. But like the BBC, and now like Sky, ratings come uh, before the care and protection of children. And also, because it's the Murdoch Empire, you've got the Sun newspaper, which proclaimed that they're paedophile hunters for the country, except when the, a paedophile works in their organisation, or a child abuser works in their organisation, uh, <laughs> they, they, they keep it quiet. They do exactly the same thing as the BBC, which proves my point that this isn't just a BBC issue. This is an industry issue. Sky is acting exactly the same way. Anyway, so um, I wrote another article that I've had an interview with the Times and the reasons, as I believe them, uh, from my contact um, in, in, in the Times and the Murdoch Empire, why they weren't running it. Um, uh, and, and, of course, this caused uproar within the Murdoch empire. Um, Rupert Murdoch is personally now involved and has told the Times to run the story. That was, a, that was Tuesday um, of this week. So Jack Mulvern suddenly has to get back on the case and start ringing everybody uh, up again uh, and, and, and confirming what I've said. He even rang my mother and he didn't want to speak to him. Um, and when I told him that on the previous Friday, I said, look, my mum doesn't want to speak to you. She's not interested. Uh, she actually then, because she, 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 she was doing a lot of knitting and, you know, she had a personal line. Uh, he then handed how, how my mother, got her on the phone. And, of course, she confirmed certain things to him and told him certain things that obviously the same things that I had told him, um, uh, you know, about my experience and stuff. So we knew they were running it at that point. It was just a matter of when it's going to come out. And every day we've sort of been looking for it. Uh, but we believe it's going to come out on Saturday now. Uh, which is interesting. But of course, now I'm telling everybody about it. I've done various interviews with mainstream newspapers, uh, including The Telegraph and The Express. Um, so um, it, it, it's definitely out there now. It's getting out there. Right, right. What, what seems to have come out, we, we, we learned that children are being, have been and clearly are still being very badly abused. 
And then what we're not seeing is that mainstream media is getting stuck in to expose the abusers and bring them to book. What, what, what your particular story is highlighting is that we're in the middle of yet another media battle uh, where there's perhaps a bit of uh, point scoring that um, the Murdoch Empire has been beaten up over phone hacking and now there's leverage over the fact that paedophiles have been found inside the BBC. And so that's being, that's, that's being used back the other way. Do you, do you see it as being uh, this media war over the subject rather than getting to grips with who is abusing the children? That's what the media does. This is what this is the actually one of the problems of the media is instead of looking at the subject matter, the subject they use it as a point scoring exercise, and this happens through papers. One paper won't like another paper, so they'll look at their stories and they'll do a point scoring exercise, write some articles that embarrasses that paper or that proprietor's uh, the, the, the the owner of the newspaper, the proprietor. Um, this happens all the time. Murdoch Empire is very famous for that, uh, and they do it very well because they have so much. Um, uh, gravity in, in, in media because they own so much, um, many outlets. They can they can really do it very well. So this is something that we know, and it, it, it goes on. Um, but the reason, one of the reasons also that they're not covering it is they're afraid to, because of the libel laws in this country are so powerful, and it almost feels like those laws have been set up to protect paedophiles. As more I'm looking into this story as the weeks unfold, what have you, I'm finding more and more um, levels that aren't there to protect or out paedophiles, it seems to be, um, and it, I'm, I'm saying seems, um, that really organisations turn a blind eye, they, they won't say things, or in fact they actually legislate for the paedophile rather than the protection of children. So the priorities are, are all skew if. So the media is very afraid. Everyone I've spoken to is scared to mention people's names. Now, what was interesting about the Times uh, interview, if it had it come out at the time, would have been me revealing people's names. Because, look, I'm not afraid of these people. You know, um, I don't want to work in their industry anymore. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared of their repercussions. You can sue me all you like. The truth is the truth. You know, um, uh, Ken Clark sent out an email to um, people who own blogs and stuff, uh, asking them to take it down and expecting that that would happen. That's a politician putting the cabinet office to work, censoring the, the, the alternative media because they're telling the truth about something. Um, uh Ben if, uh, ben, if if I may, just just to interject there, um, so so that we're being absolutely down the line on this. You you're obviously making very very serious allegations uh, because we're talking ab uh, about inappropriate sexual behaviour um, in 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 your case at the time with people believing that you were actually underage, and you've mentioned Mr. Clark's name. Um, what I'd like to do for um, viewers and listeners is, is actually read out Mr. Clark's statement because I think this is very important. He's saying that your comments are a complete fabrication and highly defamatory. He's never been involved in any incidents of this kind. He was not involved in cash for questions at the time he was a minister and therefore could not ask questions. He's firmly heterosexual. And like most parliamentarians, he vaguely knew Ian Greer, Greer but had no dealings with him. And, and he ends by saying the most charitable interpretation is that this is a case of mistaken identity. Now, we wanted, of course, to put across uh, Mr. Clark's uh, response, and it's only right that that should be, be made known. So he is saying that um, you've got a, mis a case of mistaken identity. What's your reply to that? Well, uh, let's look at the, the, the letter. Um, he says that um, he's not homosexual. Never said he was. Um, uh, we've not accused him of being homosexual in any way. Um, what I've accused him of is groping me in an office of a political lobbyist. I haven't accused him of being involved in cash for questions, but he was in the office when I went to visit Ian Greer. Um, uh, to put this meeting in context, um, I, the production team had met various politicians and what have you, and um, uh, I was sent with a, an envelope uh, to Ian Greer, telling him good news that uh, the company was going to hire him and we were going to pay him cash uh, uh, the first instalment. So I was put in a cab, sent round the corner to Victoria from the Hyde Park residence where we were staying as a production team, and I delivered this news to Ian Greer. When I went into the office, um, obviously I spoke to reception first, she said yes, called on the phone, said you can go up. Uh, went up the stairs to a, a big reception room, and Ian Greer's office was off that, 
I handed in the letter. Now, when I walked through the door, there's Ken Clark in the office. Uh, I don't know what they were talking about. I don't know why Ken Clark was there, uh, but he was. Ian Greer introduced him to me as this is Ken Clark. You know, so it's not a case of mistaken identity because he was there. He asked me how old I was, who I was, so I told him. Um, he knew me as Ben Worrell, which is important because that was my um, my, my pseudonym, as it were. Uh, so I told him, he asked me about, you know, uh, what I hoped to be and what I wanted to do. And I had my story. I was, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, an actor doing a part here. You know, it, this was like a real thing, a real situation. Um, they offered me a couple of drinks. I, it was whiskey. I found the first one because I was nervous. And then um, I sipped the second one. I don't think I finished it. Um, however, I went into that situation with a uh, covert uh, camera in a briefcase. And, um, and I put that on the uh, table. And so I filmed the entire scene. And so uh, Ken Clark and, and Ian Greer and I were ch chit-chatting in here. It's very pleasant. They're very pleasant people. There's nothing nasty going on. Um, and uh, Ken Clark turned around and literally put his hand uh, on my genitals over my trousers. Just left it there for about five seconds. I was stunned. I, he pulled it away and carried on his conversation like it was the, the most natural thing in the world. Now, I've told this story to people for years. And, and, and people go, oh, okay, well, then, you know, and, and no one really believes it and what have you. Um, and then when, when we, um, so, you know, I, I was doing the articles. So that's the context of it. When um, the panorama came out, and obviously there's a guy sitting there saying, Jimmy Savile just put his hand on my genitals, left it there for a little while, took it off. Well, that's exactly what I'd written about the week before. That's exactly what happened to me with Ken Clark. So I'm not accusing Ken Clark of being gay. I'm not accusing him of being cash for questions. He is a minister, or was a minister, and he was in a political, a very powerful political lobbying uh, lobbyist office, so he needs to answer those questions. In actual fact, from the tenor of the email, I think they're actually m most concerned uh, with that, actually, rather than him having a grope. Um, right, okay, so you're absolutely standing by your allegations. And Ben, um, at the moment, of course, we've got police investigations going on in into, uh, well, of course, Jimmy Savile, but it does appear that under Operation U-Tree, which is the name of the Savile operation, that that's beginning to expand. Have, have you actually had contact with the police and have, have you made complaints? Uh, complaints about uh, what's happened to you and what, and what you know? Yeah, no, not yet. We're actually working it out right now um, because I think it is important to contract, uh, contact um, Operation Utri and give them the, 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 the experiences that I have. Uh, so we'll be doing that in the next few days. We're making complaints to the BBC officially uh, through the BBC Complaints Department about members of staff, even though I do know that the nine members of staff that basically they're talking about being investigated of uh, most of those the people that i've accused um uh so i'll be making official complaints through the bbc not just having journalists call them up and accuse them over through a paper or something so um so yeah i, I will be talking to operation new tree at some point uh, of course if they want to contact me uh, sooner then i'm quite happy to talk about it i've also said to people that i'm, I'm quite happy to sign an affidavit um about my experiences especially with ken clark and to testify that when I was there. He even joked, he said, you know, that Ian Greer had a parliamentary bell uh, in his office so that he'd know when to go back and vote, well, to, to go back to, to the House of Commons and vote. Well, you know, I mean, this is detail now, you know, uh, and things. How would I know that <laughs> had I not been there, had he not said that? Right. And the other question I'd like to ask you is, have you ever received any money for any of the uh, stories and information you're putting forward? No, absolutely not. I've been very clear about this. Even when the Times, um, the, the code for money in the industry is called exclusivity. If you're prepared to do an exclusive, uh, the papers say, well, you know, uh, we, we usually pay for exclusives. On this occasion, um, I wanted no money whatsoever. It is not about money. Uh, I've accepted no money. It was actually, it, none was offered except for the word exclusive. Um, all I said was that I just want to guarantee that the story will run. That was it. So, um, uh, so yes, no, I've received no payments or anything. And you can't do stories like this and, and, and break it for money. Who, who, what would that make me? That would be dis I'd just be as despicable as all those other people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'd just like to read out two short paragraphs from the original post that you had on um, uh, 20, 21st Century Wire. Um, the first one is, since the original story I wrote, a lot of readers, people, and other members of the public sorry, other members of the media 
have been asking me to name names and actually accusing me of feeding the abuse system by not naming names in my initial story. So when the Times contacted me, it seemed like the ideal opportunity to name names. So um, that original, original quote by you reinforces is what you've just said. And this is one of the key things, and certainly something that uh, the UK column uh, team feel, is that we get mothers um, uh, coming to us, they're in a terrible state, they're being victimised or something horrible has happened with their children, but they're all terrified of speaking out. And the reason that uh, certainly mothers and fathers are terrified of speaking out in the child protection system is because every, every direction they move in, uh, social services or child services or the local authority or the local authority solicitor, they always say, don't talk to the media, don't talk to your family, don't talk to friends. And so the, the key policy, it seems to me, around the abuse of children is that you, you try and isolate the children and you certainly try and isolate the people who um, would try and step forward to help them. So this, this business about naming names, people are frightened to name names. They're in, a lot of them are embarrassed about embarrassed, they feel terrible about what's happened to them. Um, so it's very difficult getting people to step forward uh, uh, and actually name the names. Um, the UK column for over a year has been dealing with victims of abuse at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College and um, it's taken enormous uh, courage from, from some of those young people to actually tell us what they know and to name names uh, because it's a confidence um, uh, issue. Have any, have any other victims come forward and spoken to you direct who've experienced trouble within the BBC or the, mo the, the wider media? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I've got emails from uh, friends and stuff who um, have contacted me or, or, you know, or people who were in the industry um, have contacted me and said, yep, you're spot on. That's exactly pretty much what's happened to me. You know, uh, you know, and good luck with getting the story out, and and kind of laughing about that as well, saying uh, it's not going to happen. You know, well, it is going to happen because what you need to be first and foremost is not afraid of these people. These people, uh, they may appear very powerful. They may appear to be um, very uh, big politicians and very powerful people, or very famous actors or celebrities. But in actual fact, they have no power whatsoever. They're very weak, scared individuals, terrified they're going to be found out, in fact. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm well prepared to be abused, beaten up some more by these people when they kick and scream when they've been named in the newspaper. But I will stand up and name people. Um, I couldn't name them in the original article because Patrick Henningsen of the 21st Century Wire doesn't have the, 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 the capacity to fend off a, a huge libel lawsuit. Uh, and neither pretty much does any other uh, alternative media um, uh, blogs and, 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 and what have you. However, doing it in the Times, they told me, and uh, Jack Malden said, uh, I quote, we have some of the best lawyers in the world. And of course they do. So um, uh, that's why I named names in the Times. And that's why it's such a letdown. That's why it's such a betrayal by the Murdoch empire that when they had their opportunity to LP the files and child abusers, they failed the country. Now, what does that say about that the Sun newspaper and all the stories that they've done over the years? Does it mean anything? Their reputation is just as much tattered as the BBC. Well, I'm, I'm, I think that's a very um, strong point you raise. I'm going to uh, I'm going to be a bit in the middle here and say one of the things that um, uh, UK column team have, have learnt over the last few years is the fact that within the media industry, of course, there are many good people and people who do have the courage and the confidence to actually get in amongst some of these um, very uh, dark subjects to try and get the truth out there. Um, but what they report very often is that they're hampered by a lack of budgets that many of the media companies simply don't, don't do investigative journalism. So you have good reporters who would do the right thing if they were let off the leash, but they can't actually do their job because they're told, well, there's no money for you to travel. And increasingly, we're picking up from journalists who are talking to us that they describe a culture where you simply go into, the, into work to sit at a desk, 
to feed off internet stories and then to regurgitate those stories as supposedly the latest hot news. So um, what I'm really saying is that um, it's not the whole of the media and the newspaper industry that's, that's bad. There are good people in there. But definitely there seems to be a uh, hand at the top which doesn't want them to investigate. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. And look, you know, I'm working on a story at the moment about the BBC Trust. Uh, the BBC Trust are, are not representative of um, uh, the, the members of the, of the country who pay the licence fee. Um, there's bankers, there's the Rothschilds banker on there, there's various other bankers and what have you. Um, people who own large media organisations are involved in the trust. And also people who are connected with uh, other politicians who, who have got have done questionable things. And I'm just wondering how can we trust the BBC Trust, you know, to actually do an independent investigation. The whole culture of the BBC has to change now um, from how the, the trust is, is delivers um, I mean, you know, what happens is that we, as individuals, pay our licence fee, and then the BBC Trust says, well, you're not responsible enough to, to, to dole out the money to the BBC. You, you won't understand, you won't know what to do with it. So uh, us private bankers and what have you, and very powerful politicians, must spend your money for you. Well, you know, really, the BBC Trust should be made up of members of the public. You know, we could turn it into a TV show, vote for them to go on it or something, I don't know. But the point is, is that it's from the very top, so the BBC Trust to the Director General of the BBC. I know Mark Thompson very well, who was Director General of the BBC um, uh, when uh, the uh, Newsline uh, item was dropped. He's saying that he wasn't made aware of it. That is absolutely rubbish. Uh, Mark Thompson, being the Director General, would have been in touch with his programme directors, especially because someone had an issue over a program, you know, you've got a Christmas special, the most watched time of year for television, and they're, they're wanting to pull the program because of a Newsnight investigation. My first question would be, how bad the investigation? What's it saying? Um, and of course, I would have been told, and I would have immediately pulled the two Christmas specials and ran with the news. So in other words, in the BBC, life entertainment overrides news. In what universe does Mark Thompson live in where that can actually take place? So, so for him to say that he's not... Um, he didn't know, uh, is, is, is absolute rubbish. He's a control freak. I knew him from Channel 4, and the best piece of advice Mark Thompson ever gave me was, if you can't stand the heat, don't get in the kitchen kind of uh, thing. Well, the same thing here. Um, uh, he's in really deep trouble now, and he's put himself in a position, again, where he's, he's claiming, you know, eyes wide shut, you know, I, I, I didn't see, I didn't hear anything, you know, um, uh, which, is, which is absolutely rubbish. He ran that organisation with Lion Fist, and I know that from people who, who've worked in there um, uh, while, while his reign was on there, and he, you know, cut a lot of jobs and what have you, and, and really was, is nothing that he wasn't into. Yes, I understand that he may not have been into the idea of knowing exactly what the investigation is about, because the director generals don't, they're the, they're the people that captain the ship kind of thing. Um, they're not to know exactly what each department's doing and when, uh, but he would have known during that period of time uh, when they were looking to pull the programmes and re-jiggle uh, the schedule. Well, now George Entwistle is uh, Director General. Well, he was programme director at the time. Well, it was his Christmas special that he didn't want to pull. So again, you know, how impartial is this investigation going to be when George Entwistle really is putting himself in the firing line? So even though he's been in the job just a matter of weeks, he really needs to go and go now because he's protecting paedophiles and abusers, and I'm not afraid to say that. Right. Um, uh, ben, there's another little quote which I'd like to pull off the original um, 21st century wire text. Um, you said it's, uh, let me get my glasses on here, it's all rather easy to pin the entire scandal on a deceased former celebrity like Jimmy Savile, but if you're going to name the names of currently active entertainment professionals and politicians, you have to go with the biggest and strongest media outlet. Um, now, you've covered really the, the Times aspect of it, but I'm very interested in this comment that it's rather easy to pin the entire scandal on a deceased former celebrity like Jimmy Savile. Do you think that at the moment there's um, a skew, a bias being introduced to to get us to think that the whole thing is Jimmy Savile. Um, of course, he's dead, so that's a bit of a problem, but really the whole thing was Jimmy Savile, it was his time, and that's the end of it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they're, they're, they're planning to do. However, which is why I came out in the first place, 
because you've got people, you know, coming out very, you know, famous people saying, oh, well, you know, I've you heard rumours and this, something. If you heard rumours, um, you should have gone and reported it to the police. Just because the BBC has a culture of secrecy and silence, uh, it doesn't mean that you stop becoming, you stop being a citizen of the country. You can trundle yourself off down the police station, make a report to the police if you, you'd seen something. All these people that said they heard something, they saw something, they all need to be questioned by the police and prosecuted if necessary. Uh, but not speaking out, uh, really, because this is how uh, abuse happens. Um, now, if it feels wrong, it is wrong. If you're a person who witnessed somebody going with Jimmy's, let's say, hand in hand, and you think, no, that doesn't look right, report it to someone. If they're not interested, go to the police station, report it to the police. Keep going until people listen to you. Uh, but the BBC at the moment were trying to say, well, look, it's, it's all a dead guy, and Gary Glitter is made, so, you know, disgraced and out there anyway. Um, and that's that. You know, we're rest assured that the BBC no longer does that. I mean, that's rubbish, because in my day that was going on, and that was later. So from, you know, sort of uh, late 80s into mid-90s, it was still carrying on. Um, I had a personal experience. And so that's why I came up with those articles, simply to say, hey, look, don't let them sweep it under the carpet. It's happening. If it was happening then, it's happening now. And it's going to be, um, uh, you know, happening in the future if it's not stopped. I mean, look, you know, this is um, uh, Bette Davis, uh, a very famous story uh, in Hollywood where she was um, up for doing a, a movie role and had gone in to see the film executive and had slept with him um, to, to secure the role. And uh, that film executive then got fired from the studio uh, during the afternoon and another one was put in there and Bette Davis uh, went and slept with him to secure the role again. You know, this was um, uh, standard practice in Hollywood. Uh, this is standard practice in this country. Uh, not, not for everybody. You know, there's many great people in this industry, but it's being sport by a minority. And the minority use sex, drugs, alcohol. And you being underage and, and naive, you, have, you don't stand a chance against these people, even though you might think, as I did, that you're a very streetwise, savvy kind of kid. In actual fact, you're, you're, just, you're, you're stupid. Well, I was stupid. Um, but you, you stand no chance against these people who are dangling a career um, on a big TV series or in a movie, as I, it happened to me many times. Uh, now, I think, again, like I said before, if I was gay, I think... Um, uh, I, I'd have maybe had moved into the inner circles of that. Uh, I had a friend um, who was gay, who that's exactly what happened to him, and um, and he's extremely um, uh, uh, messed up by the whole thing, as you would be. Uh, I saw the the outskirts of it and looked into it, um, and I, what I saw was terrifying. I only survived it, and I really mean that. That's no exaggeration. I survived being a child actor. Uh, some don't. Um, uh, uh, simply by keeping my wits about me and uh, being quite mouthy. So when people did try and stick their tongues down my throat at auditions, which they did, when they did grope me uh, for, at various places, or when I was asked to go into people's private flats and residence to secure the path, I, I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go. So therefore, they left me alone. They don't pursue you, these people. If it looks like you're not going with them, they, they leave you alone. But because there's so many of them, it just kept happening to me time and time again. And this is just general experience. And all child actors were, uh, in, in my time, obviously before, would have experienced this now, uh, then. And, and, and it's going to be it been going on now um, because, it, it, you know, it's even, it, there's even less channels to get the story. One, the one of the things that we discussed in the, the news earlier on um, uh, was the basics uh, basics that, that we've got children uh, at the moment in general being sexualized at an ever earlier age um, and um, it's not only sex education uh, but we now got websites um, supposedly to give them uh, uh, advice on sex and uh, contraception but where that's actually taking them is, is, is to provide them with a guide to try everything that's possible um, this is a liberal agenda, and of course the thing is, and you're describing it really, this liberal, liberal gen agenda has been buried right into the heart of the media system, uh, so that we've got, uh, we've got a very, very powerful broadcaster like the BBC, where liberal people can start to skew and put their focus on the programmes they're going to, to broadcast. Um, this seems to me to be very, dang uh, very dangerous. Do you, do you think that, how, how do you view the BBC's um, morality? Um, do you say, well, there's a normal balance of people within the BBC, or would you say that the BBC uh, suffers um, 
a glut of people who, who've perhaps not got the best interests of children in mind. It's a public schoolboy arena, the BBC is. You know, pretty much everyone who's, who's, who's come through the BBC into a, into a position of any kind of power has come through a public school system, an elite education system. I mean, we all joke, don't we, about schoolboys, you know, and uh, them buggering each other and all this kind of stuff. And this is made to look normal. This is not normal. That's child abuse happening in a school, if indeed that does happen. Uh, we know it's happened in the past. So the BBC is full of people who have been through this public schoolboy system, who've been through an elite university education, um, and they are very skewed. And there is a double standard in the BBC, which is this, is whatever appears on the screen is reality um, uh, for the public. Yeah? And they are not to see the cesspit that the BBC and other organisations are. And, and, and no news gets out about it. So people don't believe you. If I said, well, hold on, you know, I know several famous people who and other, people go, oh, you're kidding me. Why would they do that? Because you don't know them. Because, you know, the, the facade is, is simply a facade. You don't know that these people are scumbags uh, underneath it. Um, and so the BBC hides it, and that's the double standard. And so really what they're saying to, to everybody in the country is do as we say, <laughs> obviously not as we do, you know, uh, kind of thing, because, you know, it's, uh, it really is a cesspit, you know. And I've known this for years, and, uh, every, you know, lots of other people who've worked for the BBC know this. And again, it's not everybody uh, has experienced uh, going through. If you're a cute kid, if you're a cute child actor, then there's a good chance that you'll have experienced what I've experienced. If you're a successful child actor, there's a good deal that because you've experienced what I've experienced. Um, there is a lot of power and a lot of control um, exerted over you as a child actor that you're not really aware of. As an adult, I can look back and go, oh, my God, you know, how did I even get myself into that situation? You know, I was attacked in my hotel room by a man uh, who was very famous, who'd come off a big American television series, was doing a play uh, in this country, and I was involved in the, the, the next play. So we were rehearsing and uh, in the theatre while they were doing their show. Their show was going to come off and then our show would go on. So we all got to know each other. You know, he bought me drinks in the bar. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, underage drinking goes on uh, in theatre bars all over the country. And in TV studios, all have bars and little clubs inside. So underage drinking goes on. And um, so I was bought drinks. I got very drunk. I was 14 years old. Uh, I then went back to my hotel, taken by him, because uh, we were all staying in the same hotel, all the cast members were. And he came through the door uh, of my hotel room uh, with me and pushed me onto the bed and tried to attack me. And that's the, pretty much the only time that I was actually really physically attacked. And it had not been for another cast member coming through my open hotel room, hearing the kerfuffle, um, uh, I, I, I do believe that I would have been uh, sexually assaulted, you know. Uh, as it turned out, he got up very embarrassed when uh, my colleague came through the door and left. And I was very shaken uh, by that. So, you know, this uh, this goes on. This happens. You know? yeah. and it ha OK, Ben, can I ask you, did you did you come across um, Jimmy Savile personally? Did you? No. Did you... No, I never came across Jimmy Savile. Um, I came across many other people, uh, but he wasn't uh, somebody that I came across. And you know what? I'm quite frankly, I'm really glad that I didn't. Right, okay. And um, did you witness things happening, serious things happening with, um, with other children or child actors? Of course, uh, we've got victims from Jimmy Savile who've, who've now come forward who, who say that they actually, they were either abused themselves, of course, or they saw other things going on. Um, you mentioned going to parties. Did you see this type of, of behaviour? Sure, yeah. I mean, these parties, I mean, these parties, aren't like um, you, you, and, you and I would have a party. These are serious, you know, these are get-togethers. And in the entertainment industry, get-togethers happen all the time. So at the end of rehearsal, you might get together in the pub and then it might go on to a hotel room or whatever. Um, uh, you know, at the beginning of, you know, uh, when you're filming your television program, uh, the first day after you wrap, you will go off and have a party. At the end of the TV program, you have a party. Parties happen all the time, but they're not really necessarily organised. It's just people going out for a drink and it carries on. Um, I was invited to really top hotels. Um, I was treated really, you know, like um, uh, like a king sometimes, I have to say, by these people. And you turn up at a hotel room and it would be a sex party. So in other words, uh, very sort of famous, well-known people of the day, uh, in my day, um, very influential people in those hotel rooms, all having sex with underage people, boys and girls. 
Um, and uh, and this, uh, you know, I've witnessed this many uh, on many occasions, all at different levels. You know, um, some very seedy kind of scenes, some sort of very sort of on the surface very plush, but obviously it's all childhood. Really. And the way they do it is they get you very drunk and very stoned and, and basically you really don't know what you're doing, you know. And, and that, from from what I understand now, and uh, UK column team have certainly learned a lot from uh, talking to police officers with experience in this field, is this, of course, is the standard method of, or a part of the method of grooming of children for, by paedophiles is the use of drugs and drink, uh, obviously, to, uh, to break them down and... and um, get rid of resistance to what they're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and also, you know, you, you, you're talking about people who are very famous, you know, and that's a, a, an allure in itself. You know, when you've got a famous person, you know, a world famous person standing in front of you saying, hey, well, look, you know, uh, you know, if you go off with this guy here, he's a really powerful producer. He will really help you. You know, what are you going to say? Okay, I'll go off with a really powerful producer, whether it's male or female. In my case, mainly female. But, you know, I went off with, you know, males trying to take me off uh, into corners and what have you as well. Um, but, you know, they, they, they want you to perform a sexual act on them. Now, you either do or you don't. If you think, well, they're going to be true to their word, you do. If, like me, most of the time, I just went, ugh, I don't want to know. I was there for the party. I thought I was invited to a party, not to, you know, I was very naive. Um, and, uh, and I got myself into some pretty tricky situations. But that's because the industry is not policed at all. And what I experienced, what I saw going on with, say, models, because, like I said, I did a lot of catalogue work and a lot of modelling when I was a kid, uh, that was just horrific. And you're talking about 12 or 13-year-old girls. But because they're, like, six foot tall, uh, they're very tall, um, they, they're, you know, they look older. Uh, but they're not. They're just as naive as I was, and uh, and they're getting drunk, and they're using, getting, they're putting anything up their nose they can get hold of, and uh, they're being abused, and and that was rampant, and you know, and and still is again, um, and people don't want to change. They don't want to say, let's not use uh, children under the age of eighteen for for modelling. Now, why not? Oh, because children are so beautiful, because this, that, and that. So yeah, and that's the problem is that children need to have a childhood. They need to be left alone. They have no business being in the entertainment industry, from modelling to television presenting to anything. Um, and we should basically, if children want to, as an adult at age of 18, join the industry, go into it, then they can go in there uh, having had some experience of life and, you know, uh, perhaps some more education. And so they'll know a little bit um, about the situations that seem normal and the situations uh, that don't. You see, the trouble is, is that, a lot of these times in a situation, and it's completely normal that you get your clothes off in a hotel room or, or, or in an audition in an office, you know, and there's several people in the office and you get your clothes off for them. You know, that's not normal. And yet it's made to feel normal. It's like, oh, well, if you don't do it, someone else will. And of course, that's what they hold over you. So as an actor, when I was at stage school, it was drummed into you that um, you did what you were told. You, you did it to the best of your ability and you don't ask questions and you turn up on time with your lines learn and, and, you, and you did the job the best that you could do. Um, and of course, so when tricky situations happen, you don't complain. You can't complain. You're told not to complain. You know, I complained once about a teacher at stage school and oh my word, did I get in trouble for complaining. So I got the message, don't complain. And everyone else gets that message as well, even to this day. That will still be going on. That's exactly how they, they teach you. So what you get is um, uh, stage schools, uh, really, are they keeping the secret for the paedophiles as well? Whether they know it or not, that's kind of what happens. Um, and, of course, this goes from the amateur level all the way through the professions. This isn't just sort of big, I mean, this, 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 this perpetrates everywhere because paedophiles go where the children are. So from the Saturday morning drama school all the way through to the big productions and, and, and very powerful people, you're going to find paedophiles. We've seen it in all sorts of uh, other aspects of life. Why should the entertainment industry be any different? Yeah. And it isn't. Ben, we, we've got, I'm just watching the clock, we've got uh, a bit over eight minutes uh, to go. Um, uh, two, two things I just want to just ask you a uh, question about is, is one, there's a lot of concern amongst victims out there that the police are not reliable in investigating these matters. And indeed, we have got some uh, police whistleblowers who are also um, talking to us about um, being involved in the investigation of, of child uh, abuse, child prostitution and worse. 
and they are then describing that their report, their investigations and, and the reports are ultimately blocked by senior officers who are either bowing to um, applied political pressure or perhaps are a little bit too close to the action. Um, what's, what's your personal view on the police? And, and you've indicated that you've had a bit of contact with them. Sure. Um, well, yeah, I don't know about any of those cases, excuse me, <coughs> so I can't comment. Um, but uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, I think when you make a report to the police, um, it should be taken seriously. If not, then we ask questions why. This is why we, you know, we need a, we, we need a free media. Um, I, I think now that there is such a, a, a paradigm shift, if you will, on, that um, uh, the culture in this country is going to change, that paedophiles are not going to have um, a, an easy ride of it. I'm bringing people into the light who I've experienced, and hopefully that will open the door to other people uh, doing the same thing in their cases as well. And so if there are police out there who um, are hampering investigations, and I don't want to believe that, to be fair, I, I, I want to believe that the police are going to do their very best um, in investigating every single one of uh, these cases, especially Operation um, uh, you know, So uh, I don't want to prejudice anything that they're going to do. And uh, However, if they are by me naming names, um, they can actually then go and do their job well, then we can see how well the police do their job as they're doing it. Um, so, you know, I don't want to really kind of say, well, you know, I, I personally don't have any experience with police sort of disrupting any uh, uh, investigation or anything like that in this case here. Uh, I, there's plenty of wrong with the police, I know that. And in a democracy, you know, policing should be hard. You know, um, it isn't an easy job to be a policeman in a democracy. Um, but they're having a really tough time at the moment because they're being systematically taken over by companies like Serco and G4S. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, there's lots of things happening in our society at the moment that are all backwards, messed up. You know, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if, if paedophiles got into the police because why not? It's a position of power. They can cover things up. So, look, you know, yes, there's going to be that going on, um, but I want to kind of go in with an open heart and say, look, you know, the, the truth will set us free, uh, as it were. And so uh, let's name names, let's get the investigations underway, and let's start seeing some of these people, you know, um, uh, behind bars, if indeed that's what they, that, you know, needs to happen. Uh, of course, with proper investigations, there's some of the times that evidence may be given, like say, my experience, a lot of my evidence is kind of, well, I was at a party and it was sort of in the um, uh, New Forest or it was in central London somewhere. I can't really remember what day it was because I was drunk and stoned or whatever. Uh, you know, maybe that's not going to be so helpful to them, but at least it will set the atmosphere and the tone um, uh, so they understand, ah, this isn't just an isolated incident at the BBC. This is a, you know, a, 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 an industry-wide problem. And hopefully the, the industry will change. And um, if the industry changes, then the policing has got to change to cope with that. And, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, um, I'm, I, I'm the one who's going to put my head on the chopping block and name some names, and, and stories will be coming out this weekend, um, touch wood, um, which I'm just doing. Uh, so um, uh, I'm going to be absolutely crucified, I'm sure about it, but, you know, I, I don't care. It's, um, uh, I'm not a paedophile. I want to protect children. Um, I can't understand why people want to abuse children. I can't see, understand why people want to hide this facts from people that people do, because obviously they're, they've got something to hide. So um, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to come out and put the cat amongst the, the, the pigeons. And at the moment, what we're seeing is we're, they're just, we're, all these people are turning in on themselves and fighting amongst themselves at the moment. So um, uh, hopefully that will continue. We need some more whistleblowers to come out, especially big organisations like the BBC, the Murdoch Empire, now we realise uh, what they're up to. Um, uh, but I think that will happen once the, uh, the culture changes. And I think with me coming out and telling my story, that's certainly going to add a little bit, uh, 1%. That. Well, that, that certainly seems to be the case, doesn't it? That, that uh, of course, as victims have come forward, so that it's given other people the courage to come forward and speak. And I think this momentum is very powerful. And I, I'd also like to say, um, on behalf of, of, of UK Column Live, that, that we are fully supportive of the work of the police. Uh, we're talking to some really great policemen and women, and we know that they are absolutely determined to clamp down on these paedophile rings 
I think the thing which has now come out for the general public, and it's been very shocking for some of them, is this fact that the rings are not just grubby old men in raincoats. We're dealing with men and women. We're dealing with people right the way through the um, social structure. And in fact, it seems that people at the top of the structure with the money for drugs, good time parties and access to children are some of the worst offenders. Um, so, yeah, police, please, if you're out there, we say to you, now is your opportunity to really get in amongst these people and deal with some of these rings. And we need to bring down people at, uh, at high levels, whether they are uh, within the political system or the BBC or the police themselves or, or anywhere else. And while you're still online, Bill, I, uh, Ben, I'd just like to mention Bill Maloney from Pie and Mash Films. Um, Bill is a victim himself, indeed, brothers and sisters were also victims and he's been working as a filmmaker for many years trying to expose the abuse of children. Um, he's done an excellent uh, documentary on abuse in Jersey uh, which has caused uh, quite a big backlash because obviously it's ruffling very many feathers. Sun, Sea and Satan, that's Pie and Mash films. And um, uh, when I was talking with Bill about what could be done to stop uh, all of the, these paedophile rings. He believes that uh, we should call for a, an amnesty so that people who are in the game but not happy with what they're doing can step forward. And of course, whistleblowing on other paedophiles would very quickly start to fragment the rings themselves. Okay, we've got 1 minute 22 seconds. A final comment from you, Ben. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. And um, uh, and just incidentally about the sort of you know powerful people with the money to buy drugs in the BBC's uh, context, you know they used expenses to buy drugs. So you had uh, quite large expenses uh, while you worked there. So the taxpayer was actually buying most of the drugs for people in the BBC to do this. These are very powerful. These are very educated people, and that's the important thing to think of. These are uh, these aren't uneducated people. These are highly intelligent people. You'd think who are involved in this kind of thing at the highest level, um, and so really. It's, it is very scary for people, but they have no power. They have no power over you. And as long as you're telling the truth, and that's the key part, we are not talking about people making false allegations. The police can deal with those people. We're talking about people who have been traumatized, abused, who are going to tell the truth about these people, and we will bring them to justice. And, and, and the only good thing that's happened about the Jimmy Savile okay. thing um, is, is that you know, his disgusting life has revealed actually how many victims, and they're obviously still coming forward, but there are. Ben, I must stop you there. Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've got to the end of the show. Uh, what courage to actually come on air and tell us these things. We can do something about it. Thank you very much for joining us. Talk to your friends, talk to your MPs. Let's stop it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>